Hi. Today we're going to look at a type of bird photography that I don't do very much of, which is basically going on these twitches. When a rare or interesting bird turns up and lots of bird watchers and photographers go along to see and, and photograph it. It's something I do from time to time, but it's not the most interesting of the types of photography I can do and I tend to put it off. I go and do something else instead. Recently there was a red bat shrike in one of the Birmingham parks, very close to where I live, and I kept looking at the pictures and photographers were obviously getting very close to it, but I just kept putting it off and doing something else. And uh, when I finally did decide to go, I found out the bird had already moved on, so I missed it. But from time to time I do go and do these things. It really started all these big twitches, I think, when phone lines became available. Before the days of the internet, if you wanted to know what rare birds were around, there was phone lines you could call and they would tell you what was being seen where. That was of limited use to photographers because it was just a, a description that the bird was there. You had no idea whether, whether it was photographable or not. And I don't think I ever actually used one of these bird lines. I used to call the weather line quite a lot. Uh, in the British newspapers, you used to get a little map of the UK. And I used to cut it out. I'd keep a copy in my wallet, a copy in the car behind the sun visor, another copy in my camera bag, because these were very important. If I was away from home and I missed the weather forecast on the radio, I really needed to know it because we're photographing then with uh, very slow film, you know, 64 ISO film, 100 ISO film. The weather was more important than it is today when we can film in almost any light conditions. So I'd, I would phone these weather lines. And just as a slight aside, a little story to tell you, on one occasion, I found one of these pieces of paper I'd cut out of the newspaper, tucked away somewhere, and it was very old quite brittle, faded yellow as newspapers tend to do, but I could read the numbers. So there's no mobile phones, I had to go into a phone box and uh, I dialed the numbers. And what I didn't know is it was so old, the numbers had been reallocated. Instead of a weather line, I got a sex chat line. Now I knew there was something wrong because after about five minutes, she started talking about it was going to be hot and steamy. And I thought, this can't be right, it's the winter. Anyway, no need for phone lines today. It's all on the internet. You can look it up on your smartphone. And the website I tend to use the most often is the Bird Guides website. There's also the Rare Birds Alert website. And both of them you can subscribe to, and then you get extra information. Now, I don't subscribe because I really don't make enough use of them. But with both, you can look at the pictures. And that's what I'm, I'm interested in. And when I saw these hoopoo pictures being taken at Collingham, up close by Leeds up in Yorkshire, you could see that people were getting very, very nice pictures of them. There was another hoopoo in Norfolk, but the pictures weren't quite as nice. The grass, the one in Yorkshire was on, was very short and it just looked very, very attractive. But I kept hesitating, kept thinking and whether I should go or not and basically finding other things to do as I'm prone to doing but eventually I made my mind up to go for it and I only had half a day so it's quite a long drive up there and uh, I'm just going to show you the pictures that I took the hardest part I think is judging whether the pictures are going to be worthwhile because people can crop the pictures very heavily and still get a, a nice enough image to post onto the, the web you don't need a large file on the web so you, you never know whether they've been cropped but somehow you get a feel for it. And I think especially when lots of photographers are taking nice pictures of it, then you start to think, yeah, this must be good. It must be a good situation. So you go along and have a look. When you go along to these events, you don't have to look out for the bird. You just look out for the crowds. Much easier to spot. This bird was exceptionally tame. He seemed to be oblivious to the large crowds that he was drawing the attention of. I photographed them in Europe many times, and you can sometimes do them from the car window, but I've never done them on foot. They're just not normally that approachable. This is taken with a Panasonic G9. This is at normal speed now. And you can see it's all a little bit on the, the jerky side. It seems to me it's faster than it is in, in real life even, which is why I really like to slow things down. So if we now just play that last clip again, but now it's slowed down by 50%, it's much easier to see what's happening. The reason I use the G9 for the video is because it's got 180 frames per second, which I will use next. 
whereas my Olympus cameras have only got 120 frames per second video. But I'm tending to use the Olympus for stills photography because it's the camera I'm most familiar with and it's much easier to use a camera that you're familiar with. I do struggle with the Panasonic G9 because I'm only really using it for video and not stills pictures very much yet. So here we are at 180 frames per second, very much slowed down, that's about seven times slow. You did have to watch the background, if you went down too low you tended to get some orange netting or some chairs in the background or even the road and traffic moving behind the bird. So all of the video was taken from the tripod at its lowest setting but when I'm taking stills I would get down onto the, the floor and handhold the camera. When you've got seven and a half stops of image stabiliser that's not difficult to do. But you couldn't put the camera right down to the grass, it had to be about, well, elbow height. I was resting on my elbows. I don't know whether you'd call all, all of these leather jackets that are coming up, but some sort of grub coming out of the, the grass. Trouble getting that one down, so it kicks it back out again and starts over. Gets it right the second time. I hadn't been there very long when suddenly it held its head up, looked a bit alert and flew away. But I looked to my right and I looked to my left and the veterans who had been there for some time already weren't alarmed, they clearly knew it was going to come back and after a few seconds it did, just flew up into a tree, landed there then returned. And occasionally there was a fence it would land on too and had a bit of a, a head shake and showed off that wonderful crest. It was surprisingly easy to get the catching shots. When the bird throws the grub up in the air and you get the grub halfway between the two mandibles, it was an easy shot because it's predictable. You can see the bird preparing to do it and about now you hit the button, you've got 20 frames per second, the chances are you were, you were going to catch it as a stills picture as well as in slow motion video. The only difficulty was getting the bird's side was onto you when it did it or head onto you, but you certainly didn't want the back towards you. If the bird has found a grub it takes a little bit longer to dig it out so you know there's a grub there at this point. So you're all prepared now, finger on the button and hit the button about now and one of those 20 frames will be sharp. Every now and then would fly away, land on a nearby tree or fence and then come back down to the grass. And here you can see how the bird behaves when it has found a grub. It starts to dig in a more persistent way. And slow motion makes it so interesting for me that you can see the way it uses its bill to, to probe into the soil but also it opens the bill to drag things away and uses them like a pair of chopsticks opening them up when they're down in the grass. And now that it's probing, look at the way it uses its body. It's throwing the whole weight of its body into it to push down into the grass. And finally, success. Okay, let's look at a few stills pictures I took. Every stills picture was taken on the Olympus camera with the 300mm lens, no extender. And I started off and finished with 1600 ISO. Didn't use any other ISO. This was the shot you're going to go for all the time. So you, you know you need a good shutter speed. 
when the bird's about the right image size we've got to watch you don't clip off the tail it's very easy to be concentrating on the bird's head and that long tail is sticking out of the frame so whenever you were about to hit the button I know my eye was always wandering across to the tail I wasn't actually looking at the head for that last split second when I'm going to hit the button 1600 and you get remarkable quality on these modern cameras you got to keep following the bird around so when it puts its crest up or stretches its wings you're in a nice position to do it if I didn't know that was a hoopoo I would hesitate for the first couple of seconds trying to work out what I was looking at but I enjoyed the session very nice to do such a colorful bird in such a lovely situation Thanks for watching.